it's great to see that uh, we don't limit ourselves uh, to borders, to the European borders, uh, but we are open also to the rest of the world. And I really hope you will enjoy this meeting. Tell us what, uh, what uh, is on your minds and uh, because in the end, we are one big family. And to, to underline this feeling of, of, of family, I would like to invite the, the, the first guest and that's uh, Stu Packer, Stu Packer from Somerset. And personally, well, we're, we're friends uh, and uh, uh, we, we work together quite a lot. And I am always amazed by the inspirational power of, of this man who, by the way, lives near, uh, near Glastonbury. So at the center of Druids and, and the spiritual center. So um, please, um, Stu, can you uh, inspire us a bit uh, before we really go into the topic? By the way, uh, uh, after the... Um, now you're you're unmuted everybody can see that uh so by the way if you like uh, what uh, someone says uh you can applaud but better is do this because it's really funny when everybody do this does this so okay Stu, the floor is yours please wow thank you um what well, well, um yes um family i consider that man there he's there on my screen uh iron to be my storytelling brother so thank you, my brother. I really appreciate this. Um, I'd like to start off with some um, thanks. Thank you to everybody whose language, whose first language is not English, because uh, this can only be done, um, for me anyway, I only speak one language and it's English. So thank you for um, thinking, uh, listening and speaking in English. Uh, thank you. Um, is anyone taking the minutes, by the way? Don't take the minutes because I'd like to retract the thanks to 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 Iron. Actually, I would like to retract it because, um, as my brother, he 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 fully understands. He called me to do this uh, this thing to inspire people, to motivate people, which is a bonkers thing, isn't it? Like, can you motivate some people who are already experts in storytelling? And it's a bit like the. Um, uh, I don't know if, if you know a stand-up comedian or, or even if you are a stand-up comedian and, and you're in a bar and you're on a, a private night out with, you, with your husband or, or your wife and someone comes up and says, oh, you're, you're the comedian. Oh, you're, you're the funny. Be funny. Say something funny now. Yeah, go on. Go, monkey. Be funny. Uh, and, and the comedian's like... Oh. Well, I feel a bit like that in a way that, that um, opening up this um, uh, uh, amazing sort of webinar conference, well, whatever you like to call it. I feel like Iron has just walked into my own private sort of like place and said, go monkey, be motivational. And I'm like, hang on a minute, mate. I'm, I'm just having a cup of coffee. Be motivational. So here it is. Here it is. Um, be motivational. We are all storytellers, uh, so keep sharing. There we are. Mm. That, no, I, there's more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do that if you want. Yeah. Actually, when it comes down to it, I actually do believe that we are all storytellers. I think there's seven and a half billion people on the planet at the moment, and those that are able to speak um are storytellers uh and where does it come from it comes from such a long long time ago this is my take on it someone may know the absolute depth of the science of this uh, and that's that's fair enough and you can you can correct me in fact put it in the chat if you know more storytelling is as young as fifty thousand years old around fifty thousand years uh, ago some of the stories of archaeology and, and science tell us stories from what they found in the ground, what they, what they dug and scraped out of the ground and under the sea. The, the relics and the stuff there said that humanity across the planet at the same time, across the Europe continent, across the Americas, across Asia, Australasia, right the way across the planet, humanity woke up into a sort of consciousness. Before we were uh, uh, like the animals in a way, uh, waking up to drink water, have food, go and hunt and gather, have sex, go to sleep. But 50,000 years ago, so these relics tell us, uh, we 
we, we did something else. We expressed ourselves in terms of uh, musical instruments, in, in, in arts, cave paintings. Uh, storytelling could be perhaps in that too. We became conscious and were able to express our art, whatever that was, to, to another human, to other humans. Storytelling could also be as old as 195,000 years old. 19530, 195,000 years old. This is when science tells us, the stories of science tell us that our voice boxes evolved enough for us to speak. We were able to go from er, 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 to speaking somewhere between 50,000 years ago and 195,000 years ago, languages started to diverge and we, we, we started to separate languages. So I'll put that in context in a way, because those are huge, massive numbers, 50,000 years ago, 195,000 years ago. The first evidence of farming in the Middle East was 23,000 years ago. So even if storytelling is as young as 50,000 years, storytelling is older than farming. Uh, another thing from science that science tells us in, in stories is that um, it takes 26,000 years for um, something that we, we do by habit, we, we do, that, that comes in our, in our, in our tribes to, to form, to, to, to be implanted in our DNA. So, so the curl of your eyelash, the wave of your hair, the tone of your skin, at least 26,000 years of evolution happens before that becomes imprinted in, in your DNA. So eating food from farms, we haven't evolved enough for that yet. And yet storytelling, is as old as 50,000 years old. So if it's as old as 50,000 years old, and perhaps 195,000 years old, storytelling is imprinted, encoded in our DNA. Literally, scientifically, it's in our DNA. It's, it's coursing through our veins. It's in our bones. It's literally under our skin. It is then our nature. It is human nature. It is nature. All the long lines of people that, that, that I am from, all the long lines of people that you are all from, they have for tens of thousands of years gathered in the archetypal storytelling circle around a fire for tens of thousands of years sharing stories listening to stories, telling stories. Storytelling is in our blood. In fact, it, it's like this, it's like this. It's not really necessarily storytelling because in this Zoom kind of circle that we are, um, there is one mouth, one brain and one heart sharing this little bit at the moment. But there are 57, 57 times two, oh, is, is whatever it is, 114 ears, um, 57 hearts and 50, 57 people listening to this. So effectively, the English storytelling is questionable. I was going to say wrong, but it's questionable at the very least. It ought to be story listening, oughtn't it? Um, and, and, and all the long lines of people that I'm from right till now, they've been doing that. And so if it's questionable, if there's one storyteller sharing a story, if there's uh, many, many story listeners, perhaps it ought to be called story sharing, sharing us, sharing humanity. And most recently, since we've been around, uh, pretty much I would say all of us born in the 20th century, there was a, something that got in the way. Um, there were two world wars that were at least really rude to storytelling. We, as humanity, fought each other. It got in the way. We tried to survive, tried to fight, and storytelling became sort of lost. Towards the end of the 20th century, and many, many dozens more wars, by the way, of course, through the 20th century, and still wars are happening now, getting in the way of our natural way of being. 
telling stories, uh, gathering in a circle, sharing each other, sharing warmth, sharing security, sharing stories. Now in the 21st century, wow, here we are, we're, we're 20 years into the 21st century. Um, we've, we've had the TV, the television, the internet. Now there's Twitter, we're, we're twittering on to each other and now Zoom. And this has all distracted us from sharing stories. So when we bring it back, and it's like I am preaching to the converted here. I know I am. You all get this from your hearts and you all have your own perspectives right at this moment. What can this lead to, this, this storytelling, this, this story listening, story sharing thing? Well, it has a power to it if it's shared from the heart. If it's shared from the heart, it has the power to connect. Storytelling, as you know, as we all know, can connect us to ourselves, our own nature. It can connect us to other people. It can connect us with understanding, with empathy, with compassion, connecting ideas, connecting visions, connecting stories from the ancients. All, all the ancient stories are connected through stories to us. It's an incredibly uh, powerfully uh, connecting um, natural phenomenon. It also has the power to transform. Um, it can transform relationships, uh, relationships, both individual, community, um, international relationships. It, it transforms ideas and visions. Uh, and we have a choice, by the way, to use this for good or bad. If we are a right-wing politician, uh, for example, in the conservative, um, <laughs> oh God, no, no, we could use it for bad. Um, it also has the power Storytelling has the power to heal. Um, and in human history at times, uh, storytelling has been more important than, uh, at certain moments, than water and food. Stories have saved lives by either listening or, 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 or telling the stories. They've literally saved lives. And so, um, and especially during these corona times that we are going through there is a spectrum of experience at the brighter end of the spectrum of the corona times there are some people who are in quarantine and lockdown on their private islands with their private jets and their private yachts and they're having a heck of a time because they can't import tennis balls uh, to carry on playing tennis at the, and that, that, this is a truth. There are people at that end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum uh, during these corona times, um, well, it's obvious people are dying in their thousands uh, in the most horrendous, awful way. We, some of us may know people who have gone through the, the, the blackest, the darkest hell. Uh, I, I really... I, how during these times this is this is uh, the thing of um why we should keep on sharing story sharing could uh, uh, and would um bring them back bring people back from grief the people that are going through the darker end of the spectrum listening telling sharing each other through stories uh, has the power to keep people here and living and give people hope to carry on. Um, there, I want to tell you just a little brief story of a tribe in Africa that I read about um, so many years ago that I've forgotten the name of the tribe, so I can't really sort of like um, doff my cap to them. So, so, uh, well, they were amazing. They, this tribe in Africa, 300 strong, this is probably 25 years ago that I read about this tribe, and when someone in the tribe went through something that we may label as a mental health crisis, uh, a breakdown, or even just a wobble, a wobble, a, whoa, I can't stand it anymore, I'm, I, feel, I feel messed up. This, this tribe who still live in the ancient ways, the way they um, gather and catch their food, the way they prepare their food, the way the, the, the huts are built, the way they live is still very much the way they have lived for tens of thousands of years. And so when someone goes through a wobble, what they do is they, they put the person in one of the huts and everyone in the tribe has the, the chance 
to go and see the person privately, one at a time, every single one of the, the 300 people. And they go in and no one knows for sure what happens um, in the hut. No one knows because only one person is allowed at the time. And it's not just the elders, the, the people who are 35, 40, 45 and older. It's everyone. It's the, it's the young, fit, able adults. It's the teenagers. It's, it's the kids young enough who can just speak and understand. The three and four year olds are also encouraged to go into the hut with this person. And what happens in there is, is anyone's guess. And here's my guess. Maybe it's just being there with someone, being there for someone. Maybe it's just that. Maybe it's going in and telling a story, sharing a story with the person who is going through their own craziness. Maybe it's to go into the hut and listen to the person. Maybe it's that. You give them the space to tell their story to you. I, don't, I, th I think I said a few moments ago, every single person in the tribe um, goes in there. No, they don't. You get to around about 150, 150 people, and the person is sorted, is, is fixed, is, is healed. Um, I'd like to just end, if I may, with just my own personal story of, of Corona. And I am towards, very close to the positive uh, end of the, uh, the corona spectrum, the rainbow. I don't live on a private island. I don't have a private jet. However, on the, the, the 19th of March uh, 2020, um, I borrowed my brother's van and I drove to London. My son lives with his mum in London. I drove 130 miles. I didn't touch anything. I didn't touch anyone. I didn't go close to anyone. I was high in anxiety um, at that time. For the last nine years, my son has lived with his mum uh, in London, and he visits me here, um, staying in his Somerset home here with me in the holidays. Now, from the 19th of March, my th now 13-year-old son is living with me for the first time in nine years. So there are also many things during these times to be grateful for. And I am so grateful through this door here that you can see just here up those stairs. There's some stair. There's, there's the stairway there up in, in a bedroom up there is my son, Finn. And I am so grateful for these times that he is now living with me. Yeah. So grateful. Uh, and so grateful. I'm just going to say, Thank you, Finn! I think, he's, I think he's on the internet playing games with his friends. He's 13 years old. Um, Finn is also my reason now to um, leave you all. I don't have to go and cook him tea. I don't have to be with him as a father. I choose to. I know this is being recorded, so um, in the future, I, I will be seeing the rest of this meeting, and I, I am so grateful to, to you all for this meeting. Thank you. Right now, I am choosing to say bye, adios, ciao, au revoir, au wiedersehen, tschüss. So, uh, stay, with, stay with us. I'm here, yeah. Stay with us for uh, with us for 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 maybe one two minutes uh, because Finn can wait. He's he's playing games with his friends friends anyway. <laughs> is is there someone who really wants to to ask a question to Stu or to say something? Just open your mic and say so. If there are two people at the same time, I will be the judge. Nobody. I mean, it's an interactive meeting. Giva, yes, uh, I'm very happy with what you said of connecting with family because it's always been working out of the family, forgetting what family time is. And I think Corona has brought family bonds together and definitely through stories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Gorgeous. Yeah. 
<laughs> One other, uh, oh, uh, Ovidiu, what do you want to say? Open your mic and talk yes. to us. Um, I really liked the invitation in, in time, in the history of, uh, of life, not only mankind, uh, of uh, making us um, capable to use the wavelength to connect between ourselves. And um, me, I'm, I'm using the example of, um, of the medical science saying that the, in the embryo, the cochlear, the auditive uh, an analyzer is one of the first who is, which is uh, developed in the, in, the, in the womb in its development, which for me, it was like, oh, we, we can hear, we can be impressed by language so early so that we are, our neuronal uh, um, structure, I think, or function will be molded by those stimuli. So it is such a uh, wonderful uh, set of metaphors we can uh, get from archaeology and, and physics and, and, and biology to really remind ourselves that uh, being human and acting human is actually being narrative and acting narratively. Thank you, Ovidiu. By the way, people, uh, you will hear more from Ovidiu a bit later because he's our third guest. But uh, thank you for, well, in this way, introducing yourself already. Good. So, um, Stu, you have to cook. Well, what are you cooking just shortly? Oh, uh, it, it's, um, it's, it's an English delicacy. It's uh, potatoes, fish fingers and baked beans. Okay, so we are so happy that we can continue with this meeting and don't have to eat at your place. I wish <laughs> good luck to Finn uh, and uh, thank you for motivating us. So, All right. bye. Bye. Bye bye. Good. bye. Good. Lovely good. to see you. Good. So, yes, that was Stu Pecker uh, and we continue with 56 people. Um, so indeed, we're going to talk about applied storytelling and um, I had the honor to, uh, to make the program uh, a bit and to invite a, a couple of people who are uh, busy in different fields of applied storytelling and all uh, from their own expertise and all, I think, on a very high level. And we will end with a very practical, uh, practical example, uh, uh, an exhibition will, which will open tomorrow here in Amsterdam with stories and stories in, in the broad, uh, but you will hear, hear everything after nine uh, about this. But I wanted to, to, to present more or less this kaleidoscope of, of applied storytelling. And this will never give a full picture, of course not. Uh, uh, being uh, uh, busy with applied story, storytelling myself, well, uh, maybe uh, all, all my time, half of my time, all my time. Uh, I know it's such a broad uh, subject, so I do not pretend that we will present everything. But I think it's good to explore some of the some of the fields, some of the the people who are uh, busy within this this broad field. So the first one I would like to invite to tell something is Eniko Sabo, and I hope uh, I say it right. Eniko, are you there? You just came in, so Hello. you yes, yeah. you are there. Uh, Eniko is uh, a, 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 a storyteller, uh, a story, a story co uh, no story therapeut. Is, do I say that right? A story uh, so it, uh, therapist. Okay, uh, because I say uh, I, I read. Closer. Yeah, and you're uh, 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 from Tipa Tupa. Maybe you are Tipa Tupa. That I don't know, but that's your association. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Working from Transylvania, if I say it right, at least uh, a Hungarian uh, speaking part of uh, Romania. Correct me if I'm wrong. And you are busy right now with a, a project in which you deal of, of in which you use stories. Uh, to uh, for mental health uh, to keep people uh, mentally healthy uh, in these times of corona by the way this is not that you just do it now you already do it for years and you hope to do it uh, afterwards as well um, so please tell us something uh, about what you are doing now eh? the, the, uh, what, how are you using stories to keep people in a mentally good shape <laughs> uh Personally, I can tell about how I keep myself <laughs> in mental health. So uh, I prepared uh, a lot of things, but uh, first of all, I would like to make uh, imaginary uh, uh, work. To close your eyes and uh, imagine 
What is the smell of the clouds? If you are through this, I want to imagine what tastes, what is the taste of the clouds? Your clouds. After that, imagine what is the sound of the clouds. What it feels to touch the clouds. And what color your clouds have. Okay, we right now are in the clouds. So I hope you enjoyed it, but stay there because I will tell you a story about a man who had wings and his name was Lotilko. And he flew a lot of times too far away, but he flew over the sky, over the clouds, and he tasted and touched and smelled and heard their sounds. And he was very in love with the sky. One Wednesday, also fly too far, too far away from home. So in a moment he was realizing that it's too dark and too night and he he has to go to find a shelter somewhere so unfortunately he knocked on the door of Tevente Tevente gave him food very good food and gave him a room to rest but as Lotilko doesn't close the door Tevente saw how he touched down his wing how he took down the wing and he thought, oh my God, he has two hands, he can walk. He has two legs, he can walk. Why do he need some wings? So he stole, he stole Lotilko's wing. And in the morning, Lotilko was searching where the wings are, where my wings are, and couldn't find it. So he went out in the courtyard and he saw Tevente preparing himself for the big hunt, ski, skis on his leg and weapon on his arm. And he said, Lotilko, Lotilko said, Tevente, give me back my wings. And Tevente said, no, I won't. Maybe when I come back. So he went away. After that, Lotilko went to the wife of Tevente and Tevente said, uh-uh. Tevente's wife was so frightened of Tevente. No, no, I, I cannot give it to you. So Lotilko went away to search for his wings. Went away and one time he heard the birds and he looked up to the sky and see and he wanted to fly and said, bird, please help me. Please help me to get my wings back. Okay, said the bird. If you hunt to us a deer, a big deer, okay. So Lotilko went away and hunted a big deer and he gave it to the bird. In some seconds, it was only the sh white shining bones. And then he asked, bird, where are my wings? Ah, you search on the left side of the river. The right side of the river. So Lotilko was so angry and he, he cursed them. He said, your peaks to be cursed. And so burned a nation of cursed peaks, raven. And you can see right now that in far, far away Siberia, there is a bird with this, this name. Okay, but Lotilko needed to go further and further to find his wings. 
and he thought that he will go back to Tevel, say maybe he's back from the hunt, okay, and he will give back the rings, but no. Tevel was laughing at him. And uh, he looked at Lotilko's very brand new shoes and said, give it to me and maybe I give you the ring. Lotilko thought that if he will have wings, he won't need any shoes. So he was giving away his shoes. It was staying without shoes in the snow. Okay. It was no hope because the wings wasn't returned. Lotilko went to the village to ask the people, somebody, if, if we'll help him with some shoes. But no, it won't happen. Because everybody was frightened by Tevente. And in that moment, Lotilko realized that nobody will help him. Then trust is in himself. So he went to the woods and he gathered feather by feather with the hard work to make his wings. And after he was done, he went to Tevente to say goodbye. He was above his house and said, bye Tevente. And Tevente wanted so much to fly that said to his wife, give, give these wings. I want to fly. And he put, he attached the wings and, and he couldn't fly. He was like a, an eel chicken, just, just on the ground. And tried the wife of his, but she neither could fly. So they put the wings to the fire. In the meanwhile, Lotilko was rising. First, it looked like a big, big bird. After, like a little bird. After that, just a point in the sky. And he was above the clouds. And I hope he arrived home safely by now. So, um, I, I, I felt this, this would be a very good coping system for us. Um, I mean, it is for me. And I, I was um, planning to explain how I, uh, how I managed to keep my uh, mental health. <laughs> I mean, um, um, my uh, method are uh, very, very interesting, but uh, I will talk about uh, immediately. The, but the, what is the mental health? That is the first question of mine. What are you thinking about? Um, I thought that the, the main line is to be in balance, to be in harmony. To be in resilience and, and uh, capable of coping. And uh, here the most important thing is the assertive communication. And the first and one for this are the stories. So uh, I love to um, spoke about Udo Markad. I, I suppose you know, all of you know about him. Uh, he says that uh, every man born with a hunger for stories. So <laughs> I think we all are with hunger of stories and our audiences is uh, so. Um, some um, researches, neurologist researches are um, assuring us when we are telling the story or listening to a story, both of our brain are functioning in the same way. I mean, in a maximum state, the the mind is functioning and the physics is is um, in leisure, and this is a trance state. You are in trance when you are telling the story, and who are who is listening 
and is in contact is in a, a in a listening trance stage so this is the first very important uh, point of uh, view of a mental health to be to be to be in in a balance in functioning um i thought it would be uh, very very important to find uh, in a mental health uh, uh, team um, what are the general uh, motives of this pandemic for us uh, this quarantine time how affects us to to find out how we can get out of it mentally uh, so so uh, uh, what i searched but you can uh, uh, really chat on it uh, what is general because everybody has the special the special motive too it is first of all is a stress of uh, being close and the pervert thing about it uh, close by ourselves <laughs> uh, the other is uh, the conflict that we accept it to be close uh, the other is a big stress of unknown what will happen what nothing is on under our control and um, the stress of money earning especially in this special uh, society part culture part this is a big stress also uh, other is the stress of uh, uh, not having a concrete um, real personal contact and the 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 mind uh, enters in an other stage of the need of other people's other people um other is a very very interesting thing that uh, in the whole world because of the uh, the crisis because of this uh, big crisis uh, has grief symptoms because something ended totally and something new is beginning after this grief okay and the, the most um, interesting uh, which i uh, researched uh, not uh, not getting out from the house six weeks is the but uh, probably everybody is um, fighting with it is a cow cows of time not knowing what day it is or when uh, sleeping when uh, waking uh, um yeah this this time cows is is uh, making a, <laughs> a mess if we don't care about it in this uh, time situation the best for uh, mental health is the program is a fixed program when awaking when going when cooking when eating when learning when telling stories to be to be um very hard on the timetable okay so the storytelling is the first and very important coping so um there is a, uh, i'm a fairy tale therapist or tale therapist or story therapist working with the metamorphosis method this means that um, on the basis every folk story traditional story has a, a motive a structure of motives and every a single uh, traditional story is a um, mirror to a human situation crisis And it's very important that um, learning other cultures coping system will help us because never ever had this honor nobody like us 
to have a world pandemic, everybody is inside. So I think that storytelling uh, helps very much because of the trend, because of the focus you are working, you have a program and you are in the here and now because of the, if you are not, you can help yourself with the fifth, five senses, as you imagined the, the clouds. Okay. You are in the here and now, and this is for your mental health, the most important thing, not to go back in time, not to think further, because we are here. And this makes an equilibrium. This makes a balance. Okay. Any, any go. Uh, the, the, the time is almost finished. Are you okay. almost finished? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So this was uh, what you want to say? Uh, I think I thought it was very interesting. So, uh, um, oh, how much how much time do you still need? Um, um, I need uh, half a minute. Half a minute. I give you half a minute. Close it. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you. So the other cultures coping systems to learn through the storytelling through the tales is very important. The empathy and to help others with storytelling is very important in, in our self-functioning, self okay. And uh, the communication through these stories and spreading hope. Because the wisdom of the, of the stories are like life recipes, surviving recipes. And when you are so stressed, one other thing, and I'm closing, the nursery rhymes and everything which uh, uh, surrounds this cultural thing is, is uh, very important. You can distress yourself. You can, you can be happy just telling the sigori mori and the benda mori and make a rhythm and, and put yourself in the present. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Is there a very uh, short question to, uh, to Eniko? Uh, one thing I want to say, after uh, we finished every, everyone, I have to get someone in. After we, uh, 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 so after uh, 9.30, the connection will stay open, so you can also ask some questions after the official ending. Uh, uh, of this uh, of, of this meeting, but maybe there is a, a short question already. One of the questions I saw in the app: What is the name of the story you told uh, in the beginning, Eniko? Uh, that is this is a very interesting. Um, uh, the man with wings. The man with wings. This is an Avanki Tungu's Tungu's uh, story. Tungu's okay. Avanki, yeah. Thank you. And John Rogers, I see you raised your hand. So maybe you want to say something. Yes, um, you, you mentioned grief and, and I think there's a very uh, famous model in, in grief counseling and hospice work, isn't there, with the five stages of grief. And it, it reminded me of that. And it's basically, you know, the first stage of grief is denial and isolation, which we've all been in. Um, and then comes anger and then comes bargaining and then comes depression and then comes acceptance. So. I found that interesting that you mentioned that. I just wanted to very add good, that. Very good. And I think we can do a lot with it as, uh, as also applied storytellers. Thank you. If there are any uh, other questions, uh, uh, leave them, write them in the chat, uh, or leave them for after uh, the closing of the, the general uh, thing. Because uh, we're a bit uh, 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 behind schedule, so I want to, uh, to, to keep the pace. And I would like to invite Ovidiu and Ovidiu uh, Gavri Gavrilovici, I hope I uh, pronounce it right. I met Ovidiu, I think, almost a year ago uh, uh, because we applied for a European uh, project and uh, I think we just knew that we, we got it. And um, he's from Romania, by the way, he's associate professor at the 
uh, yeah, uh, a university. I, I have it somewhere, but you can tell it yourself. And it was such a wonderful first meeting. It was here around the corner at the restaurant, and and this this man immediately asked to ask uh, started to ask me questions. And and of course, I knew he was uh, uh, busy in narrative therapy, so he's a associate professor in psychology, if I'm not mistaken, but you can uh, uh, correct me, uh, and also a, a narrative therapist. And I thought, hey, and, and through him, I started to read more about narrative therapy and, and uh, uh, written by the founder, and we were together in the training. And it really, it really fascinated me. So I thought, hey, maybe Ovidio can add something really interesting to, to this meeting. So uh, we had a quick chat, brief chat, and Ovidio immediately said, yes, I want to do that. So Ovidio, can I uh, give you the floor? Thank you so much, Arian, and hello to everybody again. Um, I'm very happy to, to see that uh, from the people in that project you mentioned, Heidi is here from Norway. I saluted her in, in the chat already. And I had the chance to meet today via Facebook uh, my uh, presenter before me, uh, Eniko. So uh, there are new connections and ex expanding possibilities because of this uh, special event that you so kindly invited me to be part of. I would like to say that uh, you started by presenting uh, that guy, Ovidiu Gavrilovic, and, uh, and I was almost asking you to get a chance to meet him because it seems to be a quite nice guy. Uh, and I think uh, these relationships always are op open, f open windows to know, to know ourselves through the eyes and relationships that we have. So um, thank you so much for the kind uh, description. I, I would not ever think of uh, registering for such a conference because I would not have been looking at me as a storyteller and I would not been, I would, I would evaluate myself as not being enough prepared to be in such a special group of, of specialists. Uh, uh, people are dealing with stories. So I, I, I imagine that this is such an important business and such a professional thing that I don't know enough, enough narratology. I don't know, I don't know enough, enough theories. Uh, I'm just a psychologist. So in a way, um, if, if not Aryan would have been in, in kind of inviting me, I would never dare to be here with you. So thank you for that. Uh, for that. I think the metaphor I have for this uh, 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 event is like I, I have initially, I could have seen just a huge, huge door which for me was locked and I was too little to be able to reach the handle. So, but now uh, you made this possible and you made this very humanizing. And I think uh, grace to the pandemic, we can be at home and bring our homes here with us, uh, seeing a little bit of our background and just being with regular clothes. And I think this is very humanizing and, and, and it brings some humility to our, to our meeting. So uh, I would like to start by saying that, uh, I'm a trained uh, therapist in Ericksonian therapy, which um, in Romania also has added uh, uh, connotations of suggestive therapy and hypnosis. So, uh, and that, in that kind of therapy, uh, we are using, we were trained to use paradoxes and metaphor, metaphoric stories. And uh, we use the power of language, the power of stories to invite people to go over the locking places they were in. And, um, and so I practiced uh, a bit of that and uh, I didn't really felt it, it fits with me. So I went on with my training five years later. So I, I was a trainee in systemic therapy, which is a composite model of models uh, that act basically say that um, people, people are in relationships. And actually the problem may not be so seen as only as being a psychological in, inside their mind but maybe some of the problems of the world can be seen as being systemic in relationship, how people relate to each other. And maybe not the person is dysfunctional as previous theories, starting with psychoanalysis and others, uh, structuralist theories, that systemic is, is allowing us to see that maybe the issue is between us, is how we relate to each other. Maybe the, the relationship is dysfunctional. So these new stories about, about human life and human living and human problems uh, really touched us in the in the mid 50s last century and it grew a lot in the 70s and i was trained in that and for me as a romanian post communist romania really systemic really allowed me to open up some eyes i never had 
that, that we can do something in this void, this space between people and maybe relationships can open up possibilities, releasing the power of the person and diminishing the demon that may reside in the person, but it's somewhere else in the systems, including uh, uh, discourse systems. And then among the different aspects of uh, systemic, one particular model really st struck me. And it, it struck me not because I was trained in it. When I was trained in it, it didn't really feel very special, but I met the founder of narrative therapy from Australia, Michael White, who visited Yash, my city, and he offered us a workshop, a one-day workshop on narrative therapy. And I, actually, I was revisiting what I was trained in the regular training in systemic therapy, but he started by saying, you know, how many of you are psychologists in this room? So maybe we were like half, of six, out of the 60, 30 were psychologists. And how many of you have PhDs? And 10 of us, we had PhDs. So we were very kind of proud of, of being, being in the center of this meeting. And then he said, um, you don't need those things. You don't need psychology and you don't need PhDs in order to, to learn and practice and be influential with narrative in narrative therapy. It was really shocking for me. It was like, a, like it was like I was stirred by this, by this, by this uh, um, statement. And then I started to understand that he was starting to deconstruct some of these strong words from the psychological jargon, like when, when people started to have personality. Well, the stories about personality started in the early 20s or 30s last century. Before that, people could not have personality. They, they had to live their lives without that. Imagine the world without personality, where people didn't have any group dynamics after 19, before 1965. Group dynamics were invented never much later and so on. So he really deconstructed some of these jargons of describing lives and psychological life and profession in a way that really let, let us stripped of, of how, how, how are we defining ourselves and who we become. And actually we became very human. We became stripped of these descriptions of, of professionalism. And I started to be very interested of what he really did, this Michael White. What, what are these ways uh, of, of di di connect, disconnecting stereotypes or labels or systems of jargon that sort of captures you and then you become the specialist of that system of language. And how can you free you up as he did with us? He demonstrated on us that we can be free of that. So I started to learn narrative therapy. Now, what I understand about narrative therapy uh, in a short uh, way, there is a little article that I like very much, I can share with the Aryan and then he, he can send it to you all, that uh, somebody says, a narrative therapy definition of one minute. And he has like nine little definitions, paragraphs about how, how we can understand uh, narrative therapy and there are beautiful, beautiful metaphors that uh, are use, useful to understand better in, in, in one minute. Um, but wh what is my understanding uh, is that uh, we are engaging people. We, we who, are, who are trained in narrative therapy we are using narrative ways. We are looking, we are keeping the eyes on the prize, and the prize is the story, the narrative that people can tell about themselves, and the narratives that, that are told about some people. And this, this interwoven of, of tellings, of possible tellings, of knowledges that are connecting uh, or disconnecting the person to the preferred ways are things that we, the therapists, the influential ones looking at these aspects, can help the person to engage the, the person in co-editing their own life story in ways that is dignifying, in ways that is worthwhile, in ways that they prefer. Uh, what do we prefer? And maybe our preferences change during our lifetime. So there is this engagement, continuous engagement with making sense of our life, of making sense of our directions, of our preferences. In order to do that, actually the, the narrative facilitator is looking at the person uh, in trying to invite her or him to describe himself or herself via the description that are non-structuralist, not, not via the, you know, the personality constructs or via the motivation or via the language uh, capacity or the cognition or the emotion or the behavior, which are usually the, the great components of psychological aspects of somebody. But, but to describe themselves as how they are inclined to do, to, to live their life. Like, do they have hopes? Do they have intentions? Uh, are, do they have horizons for living? How, what, is, what is their inclination to live well? And, and this kind of descriptions we call non-structuralist descriptions of identity. Uh, that is, it's not something that is within themselves, but it's something that is their engagement with the world. So we engage people with stories, with their own stories, in ways that are dignifying and humanizing. In this way, we can look at processes in the world, processes between people, 
that we can may call these processes as being becoming dehumanizing. That is, they are stripping people or disconnecting people to important cherished value, values or important cherished hopes for living that they were getting during their lifetime. And our lifetime is, is in connection with the others. And we have examples of good living or not so good living. So we acquire the capacity, the agility to define ourselves through the to better times and better relationships, to the better models of living, other people who really cared for us, offered us possibilities for growth and development. So we have our knowledges of living. Everybody has knowledges of living. And you use those knowledges of living to make sense of our lives and make decisions. The facilitator, the narrative therapist, is engaging the person in order to make visible these choices and liberating this decision in, in discourses, in conversations. We call them narrative conversations. We don't call them dialogues because it's not like two logoses, it's not like two ideas, but we are conversating, we are versating, we are making verses together, we're collaborating in, in versification, in, in meaning making. Uh, we are co-authors of a life story that is worth living. And that's, that's kind of the aim that I understand in, in narrative therapy. So uh, there are also uh, stories about uh, uh, politics or laws or procedures that dehumanizing people because they are not, not allowing people to express their preferences. As soon as you are not allowed to express your preference, this has an effect of dehumanizing and disconnecting us. A giving voice is prompting somebody to be able to express a preference, to express their voice. It is a matter of giving them the power to narrate, giving them the power to express and then to act into the world in their preferred ways. Now, other things that, uh, that uh, I would like to tell you about is that in narrative therapy, the therapist is not the usual therapist because, because we are collaborating, we are coaching. We are the Sherpa helping the, uh, the, the mountaineer going to, to his own mountain. And we are sort of knowing the ways of narrating, narrating well, narrating safe. Uh, and we are collecting, treasuring, and giving back and helping the person to treasure their own descriptions of life that are worthy to, to remember. So there are some principles that we follow in this very equal or un, uh, not unbalanced relationship. We try to be not in the center, the person is in the center, and their experience and stories are in the center. We are decentered. And also we are, though, nonetheless influential because therapy means change. So we are, we are, we are taking this, uh, uh, this mission that we are supporting the change, but what do we change? We change the possibilities of the person to, to switch from the um, stories that are populated by problems. We call them uh, uh, um, problem-saturated stories into, into alternative desirable stories, stories that describe the life as they wish, the life uh, that they prefer. And so uh, we use some principles. One of the first principle, uh, the basis of our work is uh, put it, putting things into relationships. The idea that a story is connecting some certain bits in a certain sequence according to a certain plots. Let's say, well, people have experiences. They usually tell things about themselves by connecting certain parts of experience or certain conclusions in their lives, creating stories that describe them, describe their actions, describe their conclusions. And they can, we, can, we can find in this myriad part universe of experiences, many pathways of, of telling stories. So our life can be multi-story and somebody's life can be uh, mm, dried of stories when they are not allowed to tell their story, when they are not allowed to reflect on their stories, when they don't have any audiences. So what do we do in therapy? We provide an audience, we are the first audience, and we provide a, a climate, a context where stories can be brought to life and we engage them with these stories. But in therapy, you know, people are not coming to therapy because they, are, because they are gay and joyful. They are brought to therapy by problems. So usually when we start our work, we have the person and the problem or the problems of, of her or his life. Be it my uh, mental health issue, like Aniko suggested that this is one way of, of dealing with issues, people having mental health problems, but can be relational problems, can be, you know, uh, people are, are just having symptoms of depression. Of, of, uh, dep uh, depression. Uh, they are disengaged with preferred ways of living and they would like something. They would like a kickstart. So we look at what is the story that the person comes in and we look at the person as being the person and the problem that the story has been the problem. In the th terms of Michael White, the main principle is the person is the person. 
the problem is the problem. So we, we try to use conversations that are relational. We engage the person describing the relationship of the problem or the problematic aspects to their lives and how the person is able to influence the problem and how the problem is stripping their life of what is preferred. And then in this conversation that usually starts around the problematic aspects, just because people come to therapy because of the problem, the problem is, or, or, or the lack of, of joy in their life uh, is, is acute, acute and they come to, to tell us this. Now we can move and find in this conversation with them about the whereabouts of the relationship between them and the story, some exceptions, because the problems of our lives are not capturing all our life. There are exceptions. There are moments that the problem didn't exist. The problem has a history. It started at a certain point. It can grow up, it can go down. It can, it can be described as waves or flux and reflux. And so we, we listen to these aspects. We are listening to see alternative aspects that the problem-saturated story is not letting the other aspects of life to be, to be visible. And then we invite them to tell us about the other possibilities in their life, the moments they were standing up against the problem when the problem was less, or the moments when they were really richly engaged with preferred ways of living, when the problem was not able to affect the other aspects of living. So this is part of uh, the, this principle of the person is the person, the problem is the problem, the externalizing view of the problem. And so uh, we use uh, conversations that we call externalizing conversations. And we also can uh, uh, imagine uh, discourses as being problematic. So we can talk about how stereotyping affects somebody. We can talk with somebody how, how schizophrenia is affecting their own lives. We can talk about how an emotion or a conclusion is, is perceived or can be languaged relationally. Not only problematic aspects, actually we can talk relationally also with qualities and abilities and values, you know, when you talk about what is your relationship with love and when love was apparent to you and you understood that love is possible and so on. So we can have many, many possibilities of creating this rich context of, of storytelling where the person is the storyteller and we are the, the molding the, 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 the possibilities for telling and, and preserving and supporting like co-editor of a book. We are editorial supporting the author of telling better, a better story about their lives and their and whereabouts. Another final um, principle that I have would be rich story development. We try to engage the person to richly describe uh, what is preferred so that they can uh, create a sort, a sort of personal scenarios of good living and that can be the basis for acts, act, agentic acts of, of, of moving towards that and diminishing the problematic aspects of their problems. I think really finally, good. I would yeah. say restoring yeah. dignity. Restoring dignity would be uh, an, an aim of this therapy, but dignity is not defined by us or by the law or the community, but dignity is, is, it is uh, resurrected from their stories because everybody has a system of values that usually comes from communal ways of living and from relationships that are important to them. And we resurrect them, we render them visible with, with the support of the person. And, and then dignity would be defined by their own system of reference, by their own system of values. Sometimes we discover that these are the communal ways, the community has them or the family has them. So we can celebrate these, um, these achievements, these realizations, which are influential for their actions. I guess this is, wow. Yeah. And, and I, I think uh, uh, some of the things you said are immediately, uh, are also connected, I, I think, uh, how we deal with Corona. Can you, can you say one or two words about it? I mean, absolutely. secretly, I wrote I think, something about think, it already, but. Uh, I think yeah. we did the, uh, every course I have with my students, we start the course by saying that uh, where we are now during this time, able to be here in front of the laptops or telephones in this classroom. How can we be, not necessarily heroic, but how can we be so inspired by the idea of learning despite the limitations? Because Corona actually, what happened to all of us is imposing limitations and restrictions. And these limitations and restrictions, including the loss of people maybe we know because of the illness. But anyway, everybody had to deal with, with, with restrictions and limitations. And these are, felt also as losses 
loss of liberty, loss of freedom, loss of, of my expression because the mask is not allowing me to smile. We have to deal with loss in such an overwhelming way that we need to, 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 to find strong stories, powerful stories that allow us to continue our living and, and rescue back what we feel it is lost. And, and I think people are very imaginative. And I, if you recruit these stories of resistance, of how you can still go on with your life and how can you manage with the mask and how can you manage with just not being able to get out of the, when you want outside of the home or visiting uh, your family, then people tell you very uh, impressive stories that are uh, um, very influential. Also for them, because they realize, they con being, being conscious that they have a, su such, a, such a powerful way of, of standing up to these corona as they did in other periods of life when restrictions and limitations happened. This is not the first time we had restrictions in our lives. Actually, when we were get, getting birth, you know, we had a restriction to get out of the womb. And then it was hard to have the first breath. I mean, all our life is full of restrictions and, and liberations. So if we, we, can, we can look at these aspects that are freeing up people and saying that how much capacity we still have. So we, we, uh, we understand that all that we feel, the feeling of loss, fears, anxieties, mourning, uh, also uh, angst, fury, you know, violence sometimes, because I am against this huge frustration and this, this limitation. These are responses. We are responding strongly because something was violated and stopped strongly that we wanted so much in our life. So in this way, we can recapture uh, what it is that we are responding to, how can we preserve those important aspects of living, and COVID, what can we learn from our own living and the others? How what can we learn from this new living? You know, how, can we, how can we not better understand the astronauts from the International Space Station, that they have to put their masks to go out in the inter interstellar space? Now we have to do the same. So there are many, many other ways of enriching lives, even if it is apparently diminished, or to restore value of the previous life and liberty by saying, oh, life is really beautiful. Life can be really beautiful. So I think these are the different possibilities to make Corona times, uh, times of um, growth, enlightenment, and humanity. Wow. Thank you so much. Seeing the time, I don't have uh, time for extra questions now. Sorry, I was sure. the, the only question. Uh, sure. It's very yeah. egoistic for me. But after uh, we had all the, 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 the people, uh, I think you have some time, uh, Ovidio, to stay with us. Perfect. So if you have uh, questions to Ovidio or uh, Eniko or uh, later Giovanna, uh, stay with us and maybe we even make some separate rooms so that you can talk for hours if you really want. By the way, uh, in the chat, there are some uh, advices for books and also questions to uh, Ovidio do so. And I know Ovidio is very handy with chat. So Ovidio, you can also reply some of the questions to you uh, in the chat. Wow, this is really working well, people. <sighs> Next one. I think we're going to skip the, the general route with, with the time. I, I prepared it all afternoon. And it was for nothing. Sorry, but we, uh, we don't want you uh, to keep you uh, uh, here for, for hours and hours. And we have maybe, uh, well, we have two very interesting things uh, to go. First of all, I want to give the floor to Giovanna. Giovanna, can you unmute already? And you already have an applause of Kati, so that is good. Although you didn't unmute yet, I can help you probably with it. Uh, now you switched off your. We let's let's help to unmute Giovanna myself. Yes, I... perfect, perfect. And turn so. on the video. And now we have everything. Start yeah, video. but now no, no, you turned off the video. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, now okay. we have everything. Okay. <laughs> so Giovanna, uh, uh, okay. how can I introduce you? Uh, you storyteller, story practitioner, uh, working a lot yeah. with uh, with uh, the ad academic world in. Uh, how stories uh, no, can be brought, how, we, how, how you can use stories to explain uh, academic questions, I said it, academic mm. discourses, uh, you can say it better than I do, uh, and also lecturer at the International School of, for Storytelling in uh, the Emerson College, Emerson in, College. Uh, in Forest Row. Where uh, I am now. 
indeed well yeah. maybe introduce yourself a bit furthermore and yeah, well. tell us something how we can maybe use stories also to give meaning to this uh this crisis or at least to understand this crisis better or maybe to understand that it's not understandable it's uh, up to you yes an un un understandable is very important so the the title so i'm in uh, i'm in forest row i'm at the international school of storytelling that uh, no not international the school of storytelling that is now closed but we're teaching online i am also the creative di director of what's so-called italian uh, italian storytelling center um so my my title was how do we explain corona better using stories so i'm going to to share some, some thoughts one after the other so the first uh, impression that i had of course now i'm confused after all these wonderful contributions that we had this evening but uh, my idea was that we can't yet maybe use stories to talk about Corona in the sense of stories like uh, myths, wonder tales or traditional tales because it is too close. So uh, in the German word for stories is Geschichte, which means layers. So before we are able to cut our cake made out of layers, uh, maybe we need some perspective, some time to put some air between us and the facts. And I was looking at what uh, uh, Boccaccio did uh, during uh, the plague. And everybody says, and that's obvious, that he, he, he wrote during the plague. But this is not in fact true. What happened is that there is an, a year, the plague finished, it was very harsh in uh, 1348, and then there's a full year, and then Boccaccio starts writing about, uh, about he starts writing the Decameron. And he does a very specific work, putting only 10 people for 10 days out of the story and looking at it. So in some way, I feel it's like a kind of uh, elaboration of what he lived. And I want to specify very clearly that I work with stories, but I'm not uh, a therapist, although I do work with therapists. What I do is what we call applied storytelling. And applied storytelling to me is using stories as a tool for something else. And so I was thinking, what tools can we use now to talk about what we're living, about the coronavirus? And of course, the most powerful tool that we have in stories, one of the most powerful tools that we have in stories is metaphor. Because metaphor allows us to speak and to address something that is either very difficult or very complex or uh, unspeakable. So it doesn't really matter in my work if I am working with nuclear physicists helping them to bridge their story, to create a metaphor about their work, or I am working with people with a difficult past, or uh, I am working with uh, patients with cancer. These are all contexts in which I work. I just, and because I am not a therapist, and because the work I do is not therapeutic, but it is artistic, uh, the way we address all of these stories is through metaphor. So I started to give a look at the kind of metaphors that we are using and that are used nowadays. And I started thinking that it was really, really, really very interesting because metaphors and the stories we tell shape our reality and the way we react to it. So, for example, if we take uh, the, the sayings of uh, Macron, I think the French president was the first of using this metaphor, the metaphor of war, and then Donald Trump used it immediately after. We have a very clear picture because when we say war, we all know what we're facing. We're facing destruction, we're facing death, and of course there is death. We're facing uh, um, difficulties and we are facing, we are trying to face a, a faceable enemy. Although in this case, maybe our is, enemy is not so faceable, it's not so recognizable. It is a different thing. So when we, we hear the world war, we have a very clear picture. 
each one of us, maybe it's different, but we have a, and that picture stays with us and gives us a feeling, a profound feeling of what is happening. There is another very used metaphor, which is the one of the monster. The prime minister, Italian prime minister, Mr. Conte, he likes very much the idea of the monster. And again, if we say we are facing a monster, we are looking at some, the first image that comes to, to me is St. George and the dragon. So we are facing something which is very big and we can, only face. But there are other metaphors and some that I particularly like and I, there's one and there's an advertisement that goes on social media and it is many matches one next to the other and then the fire starts on one on the first match and then it goes to the second match and to the third match then somebody slides out the fourth match and the fire stops. So this is the use of the spreading of a disease through fire, which is a very common um, uh, metaphor. And looking at it, I found that it is a metaphor that Boccaccio also uses when he talks uh, about the plague in the Decameron. Because Boccaccio never, ever, not once in the big book, uses the word plague. He use, always uses metaphor or other ways of, of saying it. And of course, there is a reason for this. So let's imagine the metaphor of the spreading of the fire. And uh, there is a beautiful story that we can use for this metaphor. I presume you all know it, but I just want to, uh, to point out a use that we can have of stories if we're using it as tools, as I was saying before, as ways of describing something else. So once upon a time, there was a big and beautiful and spread forest. And on one side, let's say on the east, started a big fire, a terrible fire. And the fire started to spread and spread and spread and started going to spread the central part. And then another fire started from south and the fire spread until the whole forest was covered in fire. There was an only little place where there was no fire. And there all the animals came together. And they started running and running and running until they found the river and they tried to take out water from the river to bring it to the, to the fire. But there was nothing they could really do. And so there was only one way out and all the animals started running towards that direction. Now there was a teeny tiny little bird, the hummingbird a bird just this size. And T did not go in the same direction as everybody else. The hummingbird would go back and forth from the river to the fire and from the fire to the river, to the river to the fire and from the fire to the river, bringing each time three drops and letting them fall on the fire. The big lion, the big mighty lion stopped, paused for a moment and looked at the little hummingbird and asked him, what are you doing? And the little hummingbird answered, I do what I can. Now, of course, this is again, a metaphor of something spreading. And of course, the metaphor of a fire and the fire, it is, is not going to change the destiny of the people who are in the fire. We all know that maybe, yes, some will escape and some will die. But there is, in this metaphor, in this story, there is the possibility for one person, for each individual, to do something, to do their share to contribute, to do the right thing. And as a, going back to the advert, advertisement of the different matches, to pull that match out so the fire will not spread. So even if we use metaphor, so we can, use, we can choose the metaphor that we want to bring, the metaphor through which we want to describe our reality.
So, do we want to speak about war? Do we want to speak about monsters? Or do we want to speak about fire? Of course, these are the, the metaphors that I have found and the ones that I had available. But I think that as storytellers, what we can do is to suggest metaphors. We can create metaphors. We can create the reality. We can choose the stories we want to tell. And we can tell them, and we can spread them, and we can share them. And doing this, we, cre we can create a new reality. This is what I really think. And in the story of the hummingbird, there was, in my opinion, that seed of hope that is the one that we can restart from, maybe. And so I was thinking, so what can we do in times of Corona? What we can do in times of Corona is choose another story. And um, I, I really admire all the people who have been sharing stories in these months. Beautiful stories shared, beautiful uh, on the different ways, on the different systems, through images, through recordings, through everything. I, I, I have not done that. I, I, I didn't find a voice. I, need, I felt that it was time for me to be in the listening rather than in the telling. But I have told only one story. And this is the story I, I feel that we can suggest as metaphor for these times. Uh, it's, a, it's a famous uh, one to tell. There's a version of this by Idris Shah, but I mean, it's a traditional tale that you can find everywhere. This version is from North Africa, but once upon a time, there was a little stream bubbling down a mountain. It was a happy stream and it went all the way and it met many things and many people and it went through the meadows and once it came right in front of the desert. Now, of course, the little stream wanted to cross the desert, but it could not. It was too hot. The sand was burning. And so he was there standing and looking at its future, trying to find the right way. A voice came to him through the desert and the voice said, the only way you can cross the desert is surrender to the wind. The little stream answered, I don't want to surrender to anyone and especially I don't want to change myself. And the desert answered, this is the only way. If you don't lose yourself and surrender to the wind, you will not be able to cross the desert. The little stream paused again and then said, yes, I will surrender to the wind. And so the little stream got lifted by the wind and was brought to the other side of the desert where it came down again from another mountain as another, or maybe the same, wonderful little bubbling stream. So this is a bit what I wanted uh, to share, the possibilities of creating. Uh, and uh, I know that this story has been effective because I've been sending it personally to, I have, my sister is an emergency doctor in an uh, emergency room. So she works daily facing, and her boss is now being diagnosed with coronavirus. So um, it's very close to our family. Uh, but, uh, and I have another doctor I work with, uh, the oncologist that uh, I do the program with, uh, with the patients with cancer. And to another couple of people, I've been sending this, uh, this story just to, yes, again, as a metaphor, as a possibility. And I think, think there's a lot of possibilities in these sharing of stories. And this is more or less what I wanted to share. Wow. Whew. Thank you so much. Thank you really so much. Um, given the time, uh, uh, I, I think there are people uh, 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 that have some questions. Uh, uh, Giovanna, I guess you have some time after uh, after this, yeah. so stay with us. If you have questions to Giovanna, uh, you can ask them uh, uh, after the last uh, uh, speaker because I would really like to, to well, we are already over time, doesn't matter. 
but I would really like uh, to, to finish with something more practical. Eh? Uh, I think we heard some very, very, very inspire, inspirational uh, talks, uh, uh, ideas, uh, 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 opinions. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm completely filled. But uh, I think it's also good to, to end, to, to finalize with one really concrete project. And it's a project uh, of the Amsterdam Museum. Uh, and I know them uh, rather well. Uh, we're also partnering in the project. And I invited Maren Siebert, who is, well, uh, let's say the project manager. Maren, where are you? Did you unmute yourself already? Uh, yes. Yes, there right. you are. Uh, uh, can I call you project manager? Um, actually, rather not, but I, I'm not sure okay. what I am in the project, but I have a lot of, uh, um, yeah. I'm, I'm very uh, into the project, but I'm okay. not a project leader. Yeah. But if, if, you, if you don't know who you are, uh, Ovidio is a narrative therapist. He okay. just uh, explained. <laughs> so go to him and he will uh, do some uh, work with you. And no, no, I'm joking. Yeah. Maren, uh, I invited you to tell something about the Corona in the City uh, project. Uh, 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 indeed, uh, a project. I introduced very quickly last uh, forum meeting already, and some of, uh, of you show he, she's not here. She asked already for more information. But Maren, uh, just to, 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 to finalize this, this beautiful meeting with a very practical uh, example, can you tell about Corona in the City, a project by the Amsterdam Museum and many, many partners I heard already? Yeah, um, yeah, first of all, thank you. I feel very humbled to uh, speak um, as the very last person. Um, uh, thank you for your attention. Um, uh, yeah, as Arjen already said, uh, I'm working on a very practical project from the Amsterdam Museum, the City Museum of Amsterdam. Um, when the uh, uh, Corona virus or COVID-19 um, started uh, in the Netherlands, as a city museum, one of the first, first things that we asked ourselves was uh, what is happening uh, in our city? Uh, what is happening with our local citizens? And what is the local impact on the city of this virus on the people? And um, actually I'm working on a larger project which is called Collecting the City, uh, which is also a, a storytelling and collecting um, project um, working towards the, the the birthday of the city in 2025. So that's a very large scale project also working together with Storytelling Center. And um, I'm organizing uh, this whole, pro well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm doing like the concept and the thinking of the project and working towards a big exhibition in 2025. And we started thinking, okay, when well, we're gonna tell the story of Amsterdam, by telling all the different stories of the citizens in Amsterdam, we cannot do that without telling the story of what's happening at the moment. So um, in a very short time, um, we uh, thought of a, uh, a way of collecting those different kinds of stories. And of course, I wasn't um, part of uh, this, this uh, conference the whole time, but the stories that we are collecting um, are uh, not only like uh, oral history, but it's also video, it's photography, it's actually ev anything that anyone can think of that tells the uh, personal experience instead of facts and figure figures of the, the things that are going on right now. Um, so from their own perspective. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen, is, if that's okay, to also make it very practical. Um, and um, show you um, the open call that we did two weeks ago. Um, everyone who lives in Amsterdam or feels connected to the city can submit their story, so it's very local. Um, and um, uh, for instance, uh, and we already, before we started, we collected some stories by important figures. For instance, Femke Halsema is the major, mayor of the city. Um, and um, so this is a very simple uh, open call, a website where people can uh, learn a little bit about the project and then sum submit their stories. And we already had some example stories, um, uh, either from uh, artists or makers, but also 
like nor normal, I mean, artists are also normal, but uh, <laughs> uh, regular citizens and bigger projects. This is a, a music video clip. Um, and uh, we selected different kinds of stories in different kinds of discipline disciplines in order to uh, also um, uh, let people see that they can submit anything that they like. Um, and I can show you that here. I think that's that's one of the people who is also in the. He's in the meeting. He's in the meeting. I think. Yeah. Are you for um, what are you in the meeting? Yeah, I think he's he's uh, preparing no. his dinner. Well, I'm breaking as we speak my fasting, so I am in the meeting, but I'm eating in the meeting. <laughs> eating in the meeting. That's okay. Yeah. So, um, well, a very si a simple set of rules, and then um, uh, here you can see our partners, and that's quite special. But because we, uh, when we first started, um, uh, let me stop sharing. When we first started the project, we uh, did a few phone calls, and we found out we we didn't want to do it by ourselves because, of course, we um, as a city museum we have a lot of people that know us, but a a lot of more people uh, that don't know us at all. So we had to work together with as many uh, organizations as we uh, could. So we're ro working at the moment with over 30 partners, um, especially uh, smaller organizations as well and media partners. So we're, we're uh, partnered up with the local television channel, for instance, but also the volunteer, the biggest volunteers uh yeah association association in amsterdam for instance and also uh working together with uh, um, ambassadors from the local deaf community for instance so because it's very important for us to not only uh, tell the story that um, um first first comes in mind but tell it as wide or broad as possible and also um i can show you um a couple of entrances because now we have uh over 500 uh entrances i think we're going up to 600 at the moment tomorrow we're opening the website so what i just showed you was the open call tomorrow it's going to be changed into a digital collection and exhibition so everything that is uh, coming in is part of the collection. Um, but at the same time, because we're a museum, we're going to give meaning uh, um, by uh, contextualizing um, the stories that, we, that are um, uh, given to us. Um, and also, uh, of course, which is very interesting, we immediately saw that there is a huge, um, that there are a lot of stories that are changing in time because it, at first it was a lot of lockdown stories a lot of the same uh, uh photographs not not very uh, original but now that more people are starting to get to know it um, we see that there are different kinds of stories coming in um, more and more interesting and um, um tomorrow it's going to be like the kickoff but What's very interesting for me as an educator, because that's my background in, in uh, uh, my working field, um, is that the beginning of the exhibition in, in normal times, it was, it, it's a physical exhibition and the people who are working in the museum, they just kind of stop thinking about what's happening after that. So the exhibition is in the museum, people start coming in. And for me as an educator, that's when it starts getting interesting. But most of the time, the money is just spent and it's just standing there and then working towards a new exhibition. And the nice part about this is that we can work with the stories, we can see what's not coming in and we can start collecting new stories or asking people to enter other stories. And I'll just shortly share um, a couple of interesting, uh, thank you for sharing the link, uh, Arjan. A couple of interesting entrances. Of course, this is what we expected. And um, there is a lot of uh, very aesthetical uh, stuff coming in. But uh, fortunately, um, also, 
uh, more and more children start joining. Um, this is in Dutch. I didn't, um, I, I'm not showing uh, text entrances because they are all uh, mostly in Dutch. We also collaborate with artists. Um, this is Bas Kosters. He uh, is a uh, famous uh, uh, artist from Amsterdam and he created a, yeah, <laughs> a mondkapje. I'm not sure what it is uh, in English. A mouth mask, a mouth yeah. mask, facial um, mask. Yeah, penises. in his own style with penises. Um, and this, these are drawings of uh, someone who used to draw in, in the uh, uh, public uh, uh, transport and now is drawing uh, Zoom faces. Um, this is an entrance from a group of uh, refugees in Amsterdam um, that are uh, sharing their stories in graphic design with us. And um, this is a very, uh, we also uh, connected with the um, Institute for uh, the Florence Nightingale and Institute and uh, one of the um, uh, verpleegkundigen. Nurses. Okay. Nurses, yeah, one of the nurses in one of the biggest hospitals in Amsterdam started a, a personal photo collection and she uh, shared that with us as well. And um, yeah, that's amazing. Um, and there's also text uh, that's coming uh, with the photos. And um, um, yeah, what I really find interesting is that we're also uh, doing a public program besides, besides the exhibition every week. Uh, and invite uh, the people behind the stories to talk about why they uh, submitted them. So, um, yeah, I think that's a very short recap of what we were doing uh, last couple of weeks and what we are going to be, uh, still be doing uh, the next couple of weeks because I think that um, it's not about, uh, it's not only about the, the, the virus at this moment, but it's also about the aftermath and of course all those stories that that are coming in um yeah the more painful and hurtful stories and the changes that are going uh to be happening in the city as well wow thank you and indeed eh, a lot is also visual storytelling there's also text but uh there is also well uh, not completely or oral storytelling because uh, eh, uh, life is not possible at this moment but there will be also some podcasts. Uh, personally, the Storytelling Center as a partner, we are really looking for uh, stories to record from a certain neighborhood and uh, we will uh, work with them. Uh, Fouette is busy uh, with those uh, stories. So, so you can't yeah. call it completely oral storytelling, but uh, uh, something that is close to oral storytelling will also be part of the exhibition. Yeah. Yeah, and what is it's it's uh, interesting because my project that I'm working on with uh, Fouet as well is uh, an actually a participative project collecting the city, and this Corona uh, in the city is is also a very much a marketing communication project. So um, I find that with the whole there's a big campaign going on, so we get a lot of stories. Uh, superficial stories actually a bit like from a lot of people that are just oh I'm gonna send in my my beautiful photograph but at the same time we're really we're working our, uh, really hard on collecting stories that are more um, based on on a, uh, uh, a relationship of trust and that's going to be like happening in the next couple of weeks and um, it's interesting to see the tension between those two as well absolutely and I think we here as, as, as storytellers, storytelling organizations are also very good in, in that authentic story, collecting those authentic stories or telling those uh, authentic stories. Or as Stu said in the beginning, can you still remember? It seems like days ago, uh, as Stu said, sharing uh, stories. Maren, I would like to thank you. I think there are also some questions to Maren. Um, so, um, what I would like to do is to close this meeting now officially. So everybody who thinks I want to leave, leave. Maybe some people already did. Yeah, but, uh, but if you want to stay and if you want to uh, ask questions to a, a particular person, then please stay with us and uh, 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 ask your questions. So I would like to end officially then with thanking you all 
from all over the world. India, uh, is Canada still with us or are they having lunch now? Maybe they're having lunch. If they are sensible, they're having lunch. Uh, so Canada, but also from all countries in Europe, I saw the Czech Republic, uh, uh, Lithuania, uh, Poland, uh, uh, of course, UK. It was so nice to see you all in my screen. Uh, you saw each other in your uh, screen. Uh, I now get from Kati. By the way, I want to thank Kati and Mattia who were meanwhile uh, checking the chat and, 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 and giving me all kinds of uh, 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 WhatsApps. And they are saying that the comedians are still here. So I'm very happy that they didn't get lunch. Um, so that uh, was what I wanted to say. I think in two weeks we will have another meeting uh, and that will be a meeting, uh, uh, our president, he and uh, his lovely wife, uh, Renilde, will tell something uh, about uh, European subsidies, etc. So this will be way more technical, but nevertheless, uh, and maybe a little less insp inspirational on the other hand, but as important uh, uh, as, as, as maybe this, because, hey, we need to survive as well. So that's uh, what I wanted to say. So I would say everybody who is uh, who doesn't have a question or you may also listen to the questions, no uh, pressure. Uh, uh, please leave the meeting and have a nice evening. And uh, if you have any questions, just uh, stay and then we're going to see how we arrange it. Thank bye you bye very much. For the bye people bye. who want to go, yes. Thanks a lot. Good I think night. In India, it's already after midnight. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, yeah, so go to bed. Go thank to you. bed. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Good night. Bye. -bye.